Welcome to First Lesson in Advanced Refrigeration. In this topic, we're going to be continuing our discussion of defrost timers, but we're going to do a quick review on the domestic defrost clock since it's sort of important as we move into the heavier commercial topics. We have to realize that many refrigerators and homes are sold as frost-free. Okay, frost-free means that it doesn't build ice up around the evaporator coil, the doors, or any other part of it, the shelving, or anything else like that. So in order to prevent humidity from building up ice, we have to have a defrost cycle. Okay, the brain of the frost-free refrigerator is considered the defrost timer. It's operated by a single-phase synchronous motor. In other words, a continuous running motor that stays at a steady speed, almost like the one used in electric wall clocks. The contacts are operated by a cam. In other words, a gear that's driven by the clock motor. The job of the timer is to disconnect the compressor surface circuit and connect a resistive heating element, in other words, electric defrost, located near the evaporator at regular intervals. The defrost heater is thermostatically controlled and turned off after melting any frost formation on the evaporator. In other words, if I have a, def if I have a defrost heater in there, and if my evaporator temperature reaches 40 degrees, I can guarantee there's no ice on it. The timer will continue to operate in defrost until a preset time has elapsed, but the defrost heater should shut off if the evaporator reaches 40 degrees. The defrost heater is permitted to operate for, this some, for the same length of time before the timer disconnects it from the circuit and permits the compressor to start operating again. In other words, domestic defrost is time on, time off. The only thing that will change is if the defrost heater shuts off because of temperature. Now if you take a look at this simple schematic, we have terminal 1 is the common of a single pole double throw switch. Terminals 2 and 4 are stationary connected to the stationary contacts of the switch. So in normal operating mode, the switch makes a connection between terminals 1 and 4. Okay we might have line voltage going to 1 to 4. When the defrost cycle is activated, the contact will change position and make a connection between terminals 1 and 2. Terminal 3 is connected to one lead of the motor. The other lead is brought outside the case. This permits the timer to be connected in two ways, continuous or cumulative run. If you take it a continuous run timer schematic, you will see that the timer motor is always in the circuit. If you take a look up here, where we go from one through the timer motor to three to neutral, that timer motor is always in the circuit. All that's gonna happen is in regular run, we're energizing lead number four that goes to the compressor circuit, the evaporator fan and everything else. As we go into defrost, we change from four to two and we energize the defrost heater and the defrost thermostat. That's the only change between the two. And again, I do want to put this reminder out there that when we're in defrost, the evaporator fan has to shut off or you're going to blow humid air around your freezer as well as warm air and eventually it will end up looking like the um, Batman's ice cave Okay, that you see on the movie. So you just need to be very aware that evaporator fan should shut off. Notice in this circuit that the pigtail lead of the motor has been connected directly to terminal 1 and terminal 1 is connected directly to the power source. Terminal 3 is connected to neutral and this places the timer motor directly across the power source which makes the motor run continuously. Okay, now, again, in normal operation, follow the arrows. Okay, we go from L1 through pin 1 through the motor back to neutral. We also send line voltage down through pin 4 through the compressor circuit. Now that's in compressor run. Now again, there's a current path through the timer motor and a path through the timer connected to the thermostat. This permits power to be applied to the compressor and the evaporator motor when the thermostat closes. Now the, the motor has turned enough and it has taken itself in defrost and normally these defrosts are preset to either 8 or 12 hour intervals. So we go from line one, we still go through the timer motor. That timer motor has to remain energized or it will never come out of defrost. 
But instead of sending it through the compressor circuit, we've now shut that all off and we're taking it through the defrost heater and the defrost thermostat. The thermostat, when it reaches like 40 degrees, will shut the heater off. There's still a complete circuit through the timer motor, as I just said. When the timer contact changes position, the circuit to the T-stat is opened and the circuit to the defrost heater is closed. The heater will now melt away any frost accumulation on the evaporator. At the end of the defrost cycle, the switch returns to normal position and starts running again. The timer motor is permitted to operate only when the compressor is in operation when we start talking about cumulative defrost. Okay, the prior slides were all about continuous defrost. In cumulative defrost, it's based on run time of the compressor. So the timer motor is only permitted to operate when the compressor is in operation and the thermostat is closed. In other words, it counts the hours that it's running. So here we have a cumulative run timer. You'll notice that under normal circumstances, we're from pin 1 to 4 through the circuit. But then we feed the defrost time clock, which is right up here in the top in the box, we feed that through pin 3, and we go back to neutral through the defrost heater. Okay, it's very strange, but the defrost heater, the resistance of that defrost heater is low enough that it will not impact the run of this timer motor that's in series. This is one of the few cases in HVAC where we see a load in series with another load. We're using the low resistance of a, the defrost heater as a path back to neutral. So notice the leads of the clock motor have been connected to terminal 2. So in normal operation, when we follow the arrows of the current that's on this diagram, we come in from line 1 to pin 1 through the switch, through the defrost switch to pin 4, and our timer motor runs because we're following neutral through the defrost heater because it's not directly energized. Now, when the timer contact is making connections between 1 and 4, it permits power to be applied to the thermostat. When the thermostat contact closes, the current is permitted to flow through the compressor, the evaporator fan, and the defrost timer motor. In this circuit, the timer motor is connected in series with the defrost heater. Because of the low resistance of the defrost heater, the operation of the timer motor is not affected. The impedance of the timer motor is much greater than the resistance of the heater. Think about a series circuit. The higher the resistance or impedance of something, the more voltage that component gets. So all of the voltage is dropped across the timer motor. The impedance of the timer motor also limits the current flow through the defrost heater so it doesn't become warm. It's very important that those two components are sized properly. So now this system is in defrost. So we have the switch has moved from pin 1 to pin 4. Now I am sending full voltage through the defrost heater. And then I'm also sending voltage through the timer motor but again, because of the differences in impedance, it is not enough to start the compressor or the evaporator fan from running. We're just using that path for neutral. Again, this is one of the few cases in HVAC where you see two loads in series. So the size of that timer motor and the defrost heater is extremely important, and it's very important when you replace these to make sure you read the specifications. The defrost heater is connected directly to power. This permits the heater to operate at full power. There's also a current pass still through the timer motor and the run winding of the compressor motor in this circuit. The timer motor is in connected in series with the run of the compressor. As before, the impedance of the timer motor is much greater than the impedance of the run winding of a compressor. You can prove that out in shop. Go ohm out the run winding of a compressor and ohm out one of these defrost motors in your um, in a domestic defrost timer. You'll see that all of the voltage is applied across the timer motor, not the compressor. At the end of the defrost cycle, the timer contact returns to its normal position and the compressor is permitted to operate. The ohm meter 
can be used to check the continuity of the contacts and the motor windings. You cannot actually open these defrost clocks up to see the internal components. Okay, what you do is you put the ohm meter across the appropriate windings or terminals and you can manually turn the position so the defrost cycle is started. You can also check with a voltmeter when full circuit voltage is applied to terminal 2. Okay. If the thermostat is closed, the compressor will start when the timer contact changes position. This shows that the timer motor is operating and the contact does not does change position. If the movable contacts become stuck between terminals 4 and 2 is a common problem. 2 to 4 should never come together because you don't want the defrost heater and the compressor to run at the same time. So basically the defrost clock runs in two ways, continuous and cumulative. Cumulative just adds the number of hours that the system is running. That you don't see as often as continuous. As we move to commercial defrost, you'll find that, the, that all of our clocks in commercial defrost are continuous operation, not cumulative. And the other thing to remember in defrost is you have to shut off the evaporator fans no matter what. You do not leave evaporator fans running during the defrost cycle or you will build up ice and ruined product all over the freezer or fridge.